Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Ovetz, a local community college professor. I'm here with Dr. Quentin Young, who is the co-founder of the Physicians for a National Health Program, which an organization which advocates for a single-payer health care system in the United States. And we're going to spend the next 30 minutes talking with Dr. Young about health care reform, single-payer systems, and some of the big issues around these very controversial issues in the United States. Uh, Dr. Young has a long, distinguished, interesting life. Um, in addition to having been uh, the personal physician of Dr. Martin Luther King, he was also the president of the Chicago Board of Health under Mayor Harold Washington in the 1970s, early 80s. Uh, he actually was forced to testify before the House Un-American Committee about the uh, 68 Democratic National Convention uh, protests. Um, and uh, also, very interesting, uh, he was uh, the chairman of medicine at the Cook County Hospital um, during probably, as far as I know, the only strike of doctors and health staff uh, in 1975. And I actually wanted to start off, Dr. Young, by asking you about that strike because it is so phenomenal uh, that I'm curious, uh, what, what led the doctors to actually walk out on strike with the rest of the hospital staff? And, and what was the outcome of that strike? Well, the doctors struck because the conditions for patients in the hospital were really very bad. The hospital was built in 1912 and was considered archaic in 1922. And this is bunch of years later. And uh, just to give you an example of, of the problems that patients experienced, not to mention the medical staff, they had huge wards with 30 to 60 people in this ward. And if a patient was admitted at 2 a.m., they would turn on the lights. There was no way to turn on a light where the bed was. You just turn the lights for the whole ward. These are sick people. And that was one of the the many uh, problems that they addressed. To their credit, the house staff had demands that were mainly patient care demands, and uh, they struck. Now, the attending staff, of which I was part, I was chairman of medicine, which was the largest department at the time, uh, I wasn't too optimistic about the strike, as I told the leaders of the house staff, uh, you know, uh, if anybody dies during your strike, and it appears to be due to your actions, you lose all the credibility you enjoy now. But uh, they weren't listening. And uh, so immediately, the, uh, the house staff, meaning the interns and residents, who were the main workforce as far as medicine went, uh, they, uh, they went on strike. And the attending staff, the doctors who were instructing them and the senior doctors, stayed on. But there were comparatively few of us. And the, my view is that the uh, administration that the, the ran the hospital wanted to have this strike broken. And uh, they were willing to prolong it to make it break. Well, I had the, and people like me, had the task of keeping the hospital taking care of people who came because the administration publicly announced, keep coming, the hospital is working. Well, that was far from the truth. And we tried to figure out a way to make them come to their senses that, that uh, you can't run a hospital at large with limited facilities if, if, you, if you don't have the staff. Well, the turning point came and we, dis we uh, discovered, if you please, that the, uh, the attending staff uh, could challenge the leadership of the administration by simply T saying they were not fulfilling the mission of the hospital, which was to give care to p sick people. When we uh, entered that plea with the selection committee, which had the authority, the strike was quickly uh, settled on the 18th day. And incidentally, we also requested, indeed demanded, that there be representatives of the house staff, of the attending staff, the differentiation is the attending staff are the teaching doctors, the house staff are the doctors in training. We wanted people in the attending staff on the selection committee, and at long last, the end of my summary, they settled it in one day, and uh, they didn't give away the store, and it was a victory for the house staff. And then, after the house staff ratified the agreement, they fired me. Do you think with the experience that we've had, especially with uh, 
the, uh, the movement of the, the, what's known as the Health Care Reform Bill or the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act in yes. 2010 with essentially the, the way that loopholes were carved into it that were so large that it, you could drive a semi-truck through it. Do yeah. you think there's some lesson to be learned about how to do health care reform in the United States from that strike in Chicago? It's, it's really very simple in my mind. We need a single-payer national health insurance system. Medicare for all is the best way to explain it to an uninitiated. Uh, the present arrangement, including the Obamacare, which passed, keeps the private insurance companies in control. And uh, the cost of doing that is enormous. Between 30 and 35 percent of all income goes to administration, which is a euphemism for the greedy uh, owners of the system, the executives and the people who invest. They get lots of money, but the cost of health care goes up double digits every year. And uh, we are alone among the countries of the world that are democratic in their political arrangement and economically an industrial system. That's what we have, and 19 other countries have it. All the other 1,900, uh, nine, excuse me, 19 other countries, they have a variation of single payer. And guess what? They give better outcomes. They have fewer uh, premature deaths or, or deaths from preventable causes, and uh, it's goes for half the per capita cost that we spend here. Our system is getting worse each year. More and more people can't afford to see the doctor or go to the hospital. And more and more people die years earlier than they would compared to other countries. So we think it's an idea whose time has come. We do have it in Medicare, more or less. The, it's a, it's a single-payer system and a very popular one. Your organization, Physicians for a National Health Program, got a lot of attention when um, Senator Max Baucus, who was given responsibility for shepherding uh, uh, the uh, health care reform bill through Congress, starting it in his committee in the Senate, um, when he set out to essentially frame and limit how health care reform was going to be done, and he essentially said, we are not going to talk about single-payer systems. What he said was, everything is on the table but single-payer. That's right. And, and I believe some people even got arrested at the, right. uh, at the opening hearing. And this is a classic case of how you address problems by f framing out actual solutions that That's can right. solve the problems. And I'm, I'm curious about this because he said that it's not on the table yet. Don't we already have a number of single-payer systems? We do. Tell us and they're that. all very successful. I've already mentioned Medicare. That means everybody over 65, period. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, you're in the system. And Medicare is a huge success, despite some impediments that were imposed on it when it was passed. People who oppose Medicare were able to get, uh, uh, get parts of it in enacted. Just the obvious one is that Medicare only extends to people over 65. Uh, the, uh, the millions of people who are younger than that don't have that protection. And then there's, of course, the VA system, which is, serves our veterans. There was a time in my professional lifetime when the VA system was rank uh, all kinds of, of uh, unpopular arrangements. Uh, where, where, you know, inefficiencies, the things we, we ascribe to government when it isn't working. But they had a reform in about five years ago, and I think most people will concede the VA system is the best system that we have in this country, not the best that the government runs, the best that we have. And they have, for example, rationalized the communication system, and they have far and away the most effective uh, communication of, of, of past illness and present illness. So you have the VA system, you have the the Medicare, Medicaid, let's say, make sure we got it right, Medicare insurance, mm -hmm. and this, this affects millions of Americans. Unfortunately, 50 million Americans, as we speak, do not have health insurance. It, for them to get seriously ill, for example, requiring a hospitalization, They'll go busted. They'll go bankrupt. Indeed, unpaid health care costs are the biggest single, biggest single cause of bankruptcy. Each year, we have two million, approximately two million, uh, 
bankruptcies, one million of which are due to unpaid medical bills. So increasingly, we see the healthcare system become not the friend and supporter of, of, of the system of, of health, but actually something people fear. So we think the only solution is to join the rest of the people who have systems like ours. And I'm talking of countries like Sweden, Britain, France, Taiwan for that matter. All 19 countries have a system of single payer. And their cost per capita, listen carefully, is one half what our cost is today, even though we have 50 million people not even in the system. So, uh, the, the, and the outcomes are remarkably better. It may start listeners to know that American health system is ranks 37th by the criteria I mentioned, vaccination, life expectancy, and so forth. Below Cuba. Cuba, well, Cuba. that's no comparison at all. They spend $200 per year. We spend $12,000 per year. And Cuba's ahead of us, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, the United States, I want to come back to the health care reform bill, but since you were talking about the origins of Medicare, I wonder if you could explain why does why have we had a century long of bloody contestation over how we provide medical care in this country? How how far back has this conflict gone and why has it been going on for so long? Well, it's gone for the whole history of this country and power groups in medicine, notably the American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, and the underwriters of these huge enterprises are politically enormously powerful. For example, when uh, we had the reform that uh, President Obama sponsored, was managed in the Senate by Senator Baucus from Montana. And he said, he didn't, this is something we, we, we put on his back to label him. He said publicly, everything is on the table but single payer. And why indeed did he say that? Well, single payer ends the private insurance industry in the business, a, a very, very well rewarded industry. Uh, but it's, its profits are measured in the billions. 30% of American premiums in hospital insurance go to pay private insurers. And their executives have startling uh, rewards. It's not uncommon for them to get $50 million for a head of a major pri private health insurance. So they're entrenched, they're powerful, they have huge lobbies, they, they they own congressmen. So we're, this is a, a very important confrontation of the American people, whether they're going to sit still while people profit over their health system while not giving the service, or we have a decent system like the rest of the countries that resemble us in the world. Incidentally, I left off the list, I'll mention it now. Canada, our neighbor to the north, has a single-payer system. Right. It's, what's interesting, too, is that in some ways, much like Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid are kind of like what we call fourth rails in government. They're exactly. almost untouchable. Yeah. And so they can't really directly abolish it or get rid of it. There would be a massive backlash like there was within a recent attempt to privatize Social Security. And so what we see happening is a very subtle kind of attack. For example, yeah. in 2003, uh, President Bush got the uh, Republicans to push through the Medicare prescription uh, drug uh, yeah. uh, amendment, yeah. which which they finagled and lied about, and claimed it was going to cost three hundred billion, and it's turning out it's going to be five hundred yeah. billion, and they kept the they kept the voting open in the House until five in the morning, um, and yet uh, this was a huge giveaway to the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. essentially, right? They, there wasn't this a backdoor attempt to privatize what is essentially a, a sacred cow of government. And, well, all of the amendments, the one you just mentioned is a colossal example of a, a chance to use what they always boast about, the, the bargaining power of, of imagine by, uh, paying for the, for the medication for every senior. You could, you could have fabulous bargains, but what they, they not only didn't take advantage of that e economic reality, but they actually made it impossible for the, to negotiate. So the result is uh, that medical costs under Medicare, we're now speaking of people in the 65 and older population who have a lot of medical needs and medication needs. 
they uh, they don't enjoy competitive advantage, even though the proponents of the of the private system always say the, there's an advantage in in uh, you know privatizing and competition and all that baloney. There are these are huge monopolies. They have uh, uh, their their medication is uh, is protected by patents for 21 years, mm -hmm. and they have other ways. Even after their patent value expires, mm -hmm. they continue to have gimmicks by exploiting the private insurers not to take the now available insurers. So the American people pay a huge amount. Uh, let me tell you exactly how much. In 1950, after World War II, the total medical bill from the first aspirin to the last day in the hospital was $22 billion. $22 billion. Uh, and I'll concede that the medical, do the dollar was worth somewhat more than it is now. But last year, 2011, the cost of the health system was $2,700 billion, over 100 times more expensive, approaching 18% of the whole gross domestic product. So our conversation has to highlight the fact we're not just talking about access to decent health care at affordable prices. We're talking about the whole economy. And the uh, last time I looked, our economy isn't doing that well. So this is a major decision for the American people to make, and I'm happy to report they're making it, despite the evil, and I use the word advisedly, the evil misinformation about health care and the arguments against more government medicine and similar uh, argumentation. We are in a, a very, very crucial uh, struggle for the whole eco economic well-being of the nation. And uh, I'm happy to report to you that, that the movement for uh, national health insurance is growing. They, they weathered the, uh, the misdirected Obamacare, Obamacare, which is now being ciphered in. There's going to be a Supreme Court decision on whether it's constitutional in March. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've allowed a lot of time for the debate. And though I pride myself in knowing what's going on, it, it could go either way. Uh, the argument uh, against calling it unconstitutional would, would allow 30 million more Americans to become private insured, prepared, and, uh, and that, would, that would make them richer. On the other hand, the uh, more conservative view is to make outlaw this, the, everything, including Medicare, and we would have a privatized system, which is the secret mantra of the people who own the system now. That would be a catastrophe of the first order. I think the only virtue in what I'm describing as Supreme Court action is that millions of people will have to d decide whether they're going to opt for a single-payer national health insurance or go more and more for a privatized, marketplace-driven system. And incidentally, it is you have to recognize these these are not two marketplaces these are are markets that are created uh, to employ monopoly and it's it's embodied in the fact that every year under the present uh, system insurance goes up the premiums go up desperately high and compete with food rent every basic need that we have so the stakes are very high it seems like one of the one of the ways that your movement might benefit is by one of the ultimate flaws in the health care reform bill is that that mandate that you were referring to that would essentially uh, create tens of millions of captive uh, customers for the health care industry without any price containment. No, no, no. Just like the Medicare Prescription Drug Act, we had no price containment. So I, and my understanding is that the, uh, the court is going to be looking the, the core issue is going to be looking at whether or not the federal government can mandate that uh, the uninsured have to buy insurance coverage. Yeah. And if that's struck down, in some ways, that kind of gives you momentum, doesn't it? Because what other avenues are left no, for that's, the 50 million uninsured Americans it, and tens of millions more who are underinsured? That's exactly right. That's what we would have before us. We would have a, a single-payer solution or we would have marketplace, which really doesn't exist. There are four or five players who control the market. There's no nothing approaching a, a genuine uh, competitive market that uh, the uh, right wing says is out there. 
And so uh, it, it will be dramatic, and uh, I think this coming election period may possibly uh, bring the issue before the public and the legislature in a very realistic way. Uh, I'm, of course, dissatisfied with the leadership that Obama and the Democrats have given in the reform that we just passed. It, uh, it does have some virtues, for example, uh, people who are up to age 26, much more than currently allowed, uh, can get into their parents' insurance. Well, that's good. That means a lot of people who don't have any insurance now would have it. And uh, they, would, they, would, uh, they claim that they would demand that at least 80% of, of uh, the monies that are paid as premiums would go for, for care. Right now, it's much less than that. So that you know, all the profit and that I've tried to enumerate. Uh, I I happen to know because he was a neighbor and a friend, and a patient actually in my practice, uh, that Obama knows what the right answer is. Ten years ago, he's on record. We have the tape where he said the only way to have universal health care is single payer. But as his fortunes improved. And he became uh, first a state senator, then a national senator, and finally president. His politics moved to the right. And uh, this, the reform that was passed, called Obamacare by his enemies, but it's the, uh, the, the administration uh, response to the present crisis, actually strengthens the private system and makes things worse. So we, uh, we want very much to have the struggle with the American people for a national health insurance that Medicare for all is one way of looking at it. And so many of the terrible problems that exist today was mentioned about, about costs of medical care. Each year this country experiences two million, two million personal bankruptcies, one million of which, half of the two million is due to Medicare uh, is, is due to Medicare, not Medicare, but uh, unable to pay the bills that people accumulate. A million every year. That came from Elizabeth Warren's research. Yeah, when she she's was at Harvard. Uh, the, the candidate. She was treated uh, by the administration not very well. So one of you know, one of the uh, the most infamous examples of the kind of compromises the Obama administration made in getting their bill through was uh, famously when President Obama met with pharmaceutical industry executives in the White House, and then a couple of days later there was an announcement that they were they were removing or standing aside um, and not trying to block the bill anymore, and it turned out that one of the one of the comp the core of the compromise was no cost containment, yeah. uh, a captive uh, market of tens of millions of more. Uh, uh, customers in exchange for the 30 million or so who will be added to Medicaid. That's right. But one of the limitations of that, though, and I, I learned this the hard way, when um, when I actually qualified uh, for my daughter to uh, to be covered under Medicaid, and, and only to discover that there were no more pediatricians, even in Marin, who, who took accept. Medicaid. That's exactly and right. so the only place left to go was the health clinic. We had one, but they decided to drop uh, Medicaid. So. Even though there's an expansion of Medicaid, unfortunately, most uh, family physicians and, and primary care doctors refuse to participate because the, the returns to them are, yeah. are so Well, that's a very low. important point because we are ever more debating, happily debating the fact that 1% of the, of the population controls over half of the economics and that 99% don't have the wherewithal to get basics, health care, for example. And uh, the Obamacare proposal does next to nothing to ameliorate that. And uh, what we, <coughs> in Physicians for a National Health Program, <coughs> feel must happen is that the American p public, which in every poll favors a single-payer Medicare for all solution, but we have to go from being a very popular idea to a politically potent national movement. And by that I mean things like the civil rights movement of the 60s, things like the war movement of the 70s and 80s, the anti-war movement. We have in this country yet the opportunity to develop public opinion and in a democratic way change policy. 
it's not immutable. If the uh, corporate class takes over the society, we've lost our fundamental freedoms. That hasn't happened yet, but it certainly is imminent. And the examples you gave about drugs and all the rest are evidence of the avarice of the, of the wealthy people. So the, this election and the year or two following it is going to be very decisive in determining the future of this country. Right now, as we sit here, the California Nurses Association has a statewide strike going on at the Kaiser. In fact, a couple miles away, the, the nurses are actually on strike. And to kind of bring this conversation back full circle, we started off by talking the set about the 75 Chicago strike in the hospitals in Cook County. And right now, we're seeing the nurses uh, probably, I think it's their third strike in the last few months. And I'm wondering, beyond relying on the art of compromise of the two corporate-funded parties, what else do we need to do to bring about a single-payer system? Well, I think it's a, genuinely is a new movement-building challenge. And I want to, I'm coming from Illinois, so it's, I can make this compliment. The movement here in California is very strong. It's been passed several times when Schwarzenegger was in place. Cynics will say there were certain Schwarzenegger would veto it, and, mm -hmm. and they, they let it pass. I'm not going to comment on that. I know that people who supported the single-payer bill in the legislature didn't vote for it this time. And to be blunt, they need to hear from their constituents what, what passes. And we have to convince Governor Brown that this is prudent. Uh, he has serious economic you know, problems in the budget. We acknowledge that, but this will help him. Name names. Well, who, who in the California legislature vote changed their vote this time? Well, uh, just to be clear, the assembly just voted it down. That's correct, and uh, they needed 21 votes, and they got 19. Now, I'm sorry I can't master their names. Perhaps you have them to hand. There's a Hispanic one, a Hispanic name. Uh, I, I just can't sum it up, and you'll excuse me. Maybe we'll put it up on the Yeah. Well, these people the have broadcast. to be convinced that their past support must be continued. This is extremely important. And uh, that, um, just to let your audience know, in Vermont, there's a move very strongly uh, from the legislature, and not least uh, Hawaii, where uh, the newly elected governor was one of the sponsors of 676, the bill in the in uh, the Congress. So three states are, are actually mm -hmm. examining enactment. We think to be fully successful, we have to have national health insurance. Nevertheless, we encourage and support as best we can the state initiatives because that's a stepping stone to having a fundamental reform. And I believe the California people are up to it. Dr. Young, it's been a pleasure. Pleasure talking to and you. Good luck with your with your efforts to bring single-payer to Thank America. You.